Hello everyone, Thersites the Historian here. Tonight we begin our exploration of the writings of Hilaire Belloc. He was an ardent critic of H.G. Wells, someone who we have talked about in the past and who we will continue to talk about. So I felt that it would be interesting to look at someone with whom H.G. Wells had considerable beef. The book that we're reading from Mr. Bellick had nothing to do with his feud with Wells. He spent a lot of time responding to Wells' outline of history, but this is unconnected. In 1937, he published The Crusades, which was sort of the culmination of his lifelong fascination with medieval history. Bellick was a hardcore Catholic, and he effectively believed that the Catholic Church was the be-all and end-all of everything that is Western civilization, and that the peak and core of European civilization occurred between Constantine and the Reformation. For him, pretty much everything else was some form of heresy or degeneracy. I will have a fuller introduction of him going forward, but for now, let us enjoy his 1937 epilogue to the Crusades. I think you'll find this interesting. In many ways, he seems to predict what is going on today from a very conservative perspective, but still something that resembles the world we live in in a way. And also, I would say that he kind of predicts the thoughts of Samuel P. Huntington. So, hopefully by the end of this epilogue, you will understand what I'm talking about and have a feel for why I wanted to include Hilaire Belloc in the historical readings section. Page 313. Hotton was the end. After Hotton, there were expeditions of every size, generation after generation, for centuries, and the name Crusade still attached to them so long as they were connected, directly or indirectly, with attacks on the Mohammedan, hold upon the Mediterranean coast. But they were not what the expeditions of the 12th century had been, between 1095 and 1187, for Jerusalem was lost. Without Jerusalem, without the Holy Sepulchre, the meaning of the fight had changed. The most famous of these expeditions was that which set out for an attempted reconquest of the holy places when all Europe had been appalled by the news of the fall of Jerusalem. It bears the general name of the Third Crusade. It has been written about more fully and described in greater detail than either of its predecessors. On this account, it takes a large place in literature. For most readers of fiction, and even for many readers of history, it seems the most important of all the expeditions. But it is not part of the true story, for it failed to regain Jerusalem. A dozen years later, another host set out from the west on Venetian transports. Venice, desiring to recover a debt from Byzantium, deflected this fourth crusade against her fellow Christians on the Bosphorus. Constantinople was sacked. A Latin dynasty was put upon the throne of the Greek emperors. The Latin mass was said in St. Sophia. That experiment ultimately failed. It lasted one long lifetime and no more. But as a crusade, the Fourth Crusade was less of a crusade than any. It never even reached the Holy Land. Frederick II attempted a compromise. It was disingenuous and bound to fail, if for no other reason than because he was fighting the church and because his success in any field meant the breakup of Christendom. Later in the same century, Louis IX of France, the saint, struck against the Muhammadan power in Egypt and failed. At the end of his life, he returned to strike against it again in Tunis, and there died, having effected nothing. Not long after this, the last of the seaports on the Syrian shore was surrendered to the Mohammedans. Antioch lingered on. That went in its turn, and after it had fallen to the Moslem, no Western ruler had power in the Syrian land. The struggle against the Mohammedan did not cease, though he pushed on to Constantinople and to the islands of the sea, swept over the Balkans, seized the Hungarian plain, and at last threatened Vienna. But the name Crusade died out, and the spirit died with it. There was indeed 
but one crusade, that of which I have sketched the main outline in this book. It was the great breaking out of all Western Europe into the Orient for the rescue of the Holy Sepulchre, and within one very long lifetime it had failed. For with Jerusalem in the hands of the infidel, the purpose of the original great campaign was gone, its fruits were lost. It had all been one continuous battle, wherein lesser reinforcement was continual, and one main reinforcement in the middle of its century failed before Damascus. That battle, which has been the subject of this book, began with the triumph of the crusading state, the setting up of the kingdom of Jerusalem, and its vassal Christian principalities. It seemed at first secure. It maintained the offensive for over forty years, crashed at Edessa, and then fought a continuously losing fight until the decision at Hutton. That historic episode, 1095 to 1187, was the true crusade, from its inception to its final failure. All that followed was of another kind. I have said that the expedition immediately following the loss of Jerusalem, known as the Third Crusade, was of all the Oriental Wars the one which modern men best know. There is good reason for its fame. It gathered larger armies than had been seen since the first great march of a hundred years before. The Plantagenet King of England and the Emperor with his Germans and Italians each took part therein. It was full of pageantry. It had hoped to recover what had been lost, but it was, under the surface, no more than a forlorn hope. The seacoast towns were for the most part recaptured. Richard of the Lionheart, the Plantagenet, founded his legend. The Emperor died upon that pilgrimage. It was like a great drama, played out upon the stage of Syria before the eyes of an attentive Europe, and the memory of it has survived most vividly but it could not and did not affect anything permanent. King Richard did, indeed, come almost in sight of the holy city, and many have asked why, after his victories along the coast, he did not proceed to occupy Jerusalem and to restore what he and the French king and the emperor and all Europe, you might say, had set out to restore. A dozen reasons have been given for the hesitation and the retreat of the Lionheart, and for his abandonment of that by which the whole matter was to be tested, the place of the crucifixion, of the sepulture, and the resurrection. Many have even said that the problem is insoluble, and the retreat inexplicable. But if you will read what the barons of the land said to King Richard in that wild winter night when his army and his pilgrims crouched under the ruins of Ramla, you will find the answer there plain enough. These men, who knew the land and had the military situation before their very eyes, answered, Even if we enter the city, we could not hold it. The Third Crusade, the forlorn hope, failed as all the rest of the great battle had failed, from lack of men. Commonly, the kingdom of Jerusalem was starved for men. Even when the rare, larger expeditions came out, they melted on the road, and their remnants melted faster still in Syria itself. Christendom could not or would not supply with sufficient regularity and in sufficient amount the recruitment necessary to holding its bastion in the east. And that is why the Crusades failed. When they had thus failed, and when our people were reconciled to what seemed an irrecoverable loss, there came belatedly a turn of the wheel, which no one of the men who had lived and died under the Syrian sun, battling for the thrusting back of Islam, could have, imagined, could have imagined possible. Christendom, now no longer Christendom, Christendom, wherein the faith by which it had lived was dying, became suddenly, as it were, the master of the Mohammedan world. What all the intense valor of the 12th century had failed to achieve arrived of itself as it were, through the physical science of the West and the use of new machines of transport and of war. The descendants of those who had found it possible to hold their garrisons in one corner of the Moslem world now administered the whole of it, or nearly the whole of it. By another avenue, and in another Europe, if not Christendom, 
had come in the 19th century to master Islam. We are well on in the 20th century, and of 12 Muslims, 10 are still under English government, one under French, and only the remaining 12th under fully independent Mohammedan rule. But will that state of things endure? The men from what used to be Western Christendom, the men from the Channel, the Atlantic, the Balearic, and Tyrrhenian seas, have returned to Syria. The French idioms which were universal to the crusading garrisons and dominated the varied host of reinforcement are heard again in the streets of Damascus, of Ulm, of Aleppo, as in Tripoli, Antioch, and the hamlets of Lebanon. The local dialects of England coalesced with the French of the English noble class which ruled all English villages in the crusading days have long formed the English language and that language is heard throughout the Levant as the language of an occupying power. It is the tongue of those who govern Palestine, men coming from Paris and Reims, from Toulouse and Flanders and Normandy, speak with authority in the administration of those hills and plains where the monster castles of the Crusaders and Moslem, hardly ruined, still face each other. And then Palestine, men of the same authority, speaking not indeed the tongue of Richard and his knights, but sprung from the soil of which he was king, established their rule. So Europe has returned to this vital meeting place, this bridge or crossroads where East and West debate. Our first and noblest effort to reestablish European order and tradition therein ended after the triumph of the Moslem and disaster decline and complete failure at the last. When the successive sporadic uncombined thrust at Islam which bear the false name of the Crusades in Egypt, Tunis, and where you will, when even these had ceased, it seemed evident, part of the nature of things, that the whole Orient world had been mastered by the spirit of Muhammad. That spirit had slowly and stubbornly yielded in Spain alone. Elsewhere it was politically the master. With the failure of the Crusading charge and the extinction of the Crusading soul, all Barbary, all hither Asia, Egypt, Greece itself, and the half-barbaric but Christian world of the Balkans sank under the still-flowing Mohammedan tide. The Turk, who had occupied at Hatton, conquered again at Constantinople itself, conquered all up the Danube Valley, conquered the Hungarian plain, besieged Vienna. It lay within a narrow margin of defeat or victory whether he should appear upon the Rhine not much more than 200 years ago. Jonathan Swift, as a young man, Louis XIV as an old one, might have wondered whether the peril to Christendom were not still destined in their day to return. The Mohammedan had, upon the whole, the greater unity. He had the more living faith, and he still had superior armament. The Crusades had indeed failed, and our blood was thrust back out of the Orient forever. But not forever, not even for much more than a lifetime. So little do men know of the future, so little can they conceive it, that almost unperceived by them, a profound revolution transformed the relations between East and West. A child who could have heard in France, when just old enough to note the news, how the Polish king had saved Vienna and Christendom, and check the high tide of the Turkish advance, might have lived to speak to some other child who in his turn could in late middle age have heard of that great action in which men suddenly awoke to the now complete superiority of Western over Mohammedan armament. That battle of Abukir, in which Napoleon's expeditionary force completely destroyed, wiped out as a matter of course the Turkish army. Thenceforward, the thing was decided. There were rallies. The defense put up by Turkey against Russia 60 years ago was an example. But the material power of Islam was receding at a catastrophic pace, and today the whole band of territory from the Atlantic round by Egypt to the Armenian hills, even the Baghdad itself, is under the administration or overlordship of Western European men. Islam has no guns. One might add, what is more important than guns no machinery, moral or material, for the making of them or the throwing of them into action. 
the West has returned, and one might say that the work of Saladin was plainly undone. Now the future is as hidden from us as it was from those fathers of ours who, barely three lifetimes ago, still feared the further advance of the East. But when we consider the major forces at work before our eyes, though we cannot conclude upon their results, we can at least estimate their immediate proportion and value. The comparatively recent domination of Western Europeans, English and French, over Mohammedan lands is due to causes mainly material and therefore ephemeral. One must always look to moral, or more accurately to spiritual, causes for understanding of human movements and political change. Of these causes, by far the most important is the philosophy adopted by the community, whether that philosophy can be fully expressed as a religion or taken for granted without overt definition. Now it is true that on the spiritual side, Islam had declined in one factor, wherein we of the West had not declined, and that was the factor of energy allied to and productive of tenacity and continuity of conduct. But on the other hand, in the major thing of all, religion, we have fallen back, and Islam has in the main preserved its soul. Modern Europe, and particularly Western Europe, has progressively lost its religion, and especially that united religious doctrine permeating the whole community, which unity gives spiritual strength to that community. There is with us a complete chaos in religious doctrine, where religious doctrine is still held, and even in that part of the European population where the united doctrine and definition of Catholicism survives, it survives as something to which the individual is attached, rather than the community. As nations, we worship ourselves, we worship the nation, or we worship, some few of us, a particular economic arrangement believed to be the satisfaction of social justice. Those who direct us, and from whom the tone of our policy is taken, have no major spiritual interest. Their major personal interest is private gain, and this mood is reflected in the outer forms of government by the establishment of plutocracy. Islam has not suffered this spiritual decline, and in the contrast between the religious certitude still strong throughout the Mohammedan world, as lively in India as in Morocco, active throughout North Africa and Egypt, even inflamed through contrast and the feebling of repression in Syria, more particularly in Palestine, lies our peril. We have returned to the Levant. We have returned apparently more as masters than ever we were during the struggle of the Crusades. But we have returned bankrupt in that spiritual wealth which was the glory of the Crusades. The Holy Sepulchre has become a petty adjunct, its very sight doubtful in the eyes of the uninstructured mass of Christians. Bethlehem and Nazareth are held, but they are not held because they were each the cradle of divinity. Damascus is held, but it is not held as the key of a Christian dominion, nor is the Levant held as one whole but divided between separate nations to whom the unity of Europe has ceased to be sacred. We are divided in the face of a Mohammedan world, divided in every way, divided by separate independent national rivalries, by the warring interest of possessors and dispossessed. And that division cannot be remedied because the cement which once held our civilization together, the Christian cement, has crumbled. These lines are written in the month of January 1937. Perhaps before they appear in print, the rapidly developing situation in the Near East will have marked some notable change. Perhaps that change will be deferred. But change there will be, continuous and great. Nor does it seem probable that at the end of such a change, especially if the process be prolonged, Islam will be the loser. So, interesting passage from Belloc, and I look forward to reading more of his material in the future. I'm not sure whether I will look more at this book. I'm going to try to find the passage he had on the strategy of the Crusaders and sort of the uh, reasons why it succeeded or failed. His insights there are interesting, and there's also a weirdly racist part about uh, Syrian blood undermining the uh, vigor of the Europeans who settled there, something like that. Anyway, um, 
yeah, let me know what you think of Hilaire Bellick, and I will try to revisit him in the coming weeks. Until next time, I'm Thersites the Historian. Peace out.